If you come from a Mennonite tradition, and I'm finding through some messages and contacts I've had from outside the Mennonite church, that if you come from any kind of very religious tradition, how many times have you not heard something along the lines of this? That's just the way we've always done it. Or if you are low German Mennonite speaking, you might have heard, Zahavadot Amma Yehot, or Zahavadot Zahavadot. And um, their tradition is of extreme importance to them. And I think it's because of verses like this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, partially quoted, the way that they would like to do is this. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught. And from this, they will extrapolate that if you have been given a tradition, you should keep it. If you have been taught that this is how it ought to be done, you ought to do it. If you were told you have to wear black to church, wear black to church. If you have been taught that weddings have to be in black, be in black. That's how it ought to be. If you have been taught that you should not go out on the streets and preach the gospel, you should not go because traditionally we have not done it and we ought not to do it. Never mind where these traditions came from. Never mind how we got a hold of them. Never mind who started them. I mean, you look at a couple of those, for instance, uh, apparently back, and I, I could be wrong on some of these, But the black clothing for church and for weddings apparently stems back to to um, to Russia in the days of Russia, when it was illegal for Christians and the Mennonites in particular to meet as church groups. They were told they could gather for funerals, but not for anything else. And so the story is told that they began to do dresses in black, wedding dresses in black, so as to look like they were at a funeral so that it would be a sad, somber occasion. Now, obviously, there is something somber and serious about a wedding day. And so their, their tradition was not completely unfounded. And there's nothing wrong with doing a wedding in black. It's all fine and good. So why not do that? And I agree. Why didn't they do that? However, the problem comes in when you now condemn anyone who does it otherwise. Anyone who is married in white, perhaps, is condemned as a heretic, as someone who has fallen away from tradition. Or the preaching of the gospel, again, back to the days of, uh, what was her name again? There was a, a leader in, in Russia, something the great, maybe somebody can add it to the comments, I forget what her name was. She commanded, or she offered the, the Mennonite people lots and lots of land. Because they loved the way the Mennonite people worked. They loved the way they worked the land. They made it fruitful and productive and beneficial. And the society around the Mennonites flourished. I think even to this day, that's a a testament to the Mennonite people. When they go to a certain place, it expands and it it does well, for the most part. Uh, There's a few exceptions, obviously. I think they also can do a lot of destruction. But besides the point. So, was it Diana? I'm, I'm not sure. Something the Great. She came in and she said, That if you take this land on one condition, do not preach the gospel. Mennonites were known as gospel preachers. Wherever they went, they preached the gospel. At their workplaces, at their business places, wherever they went, they were sharing the Lord Jesus Christ and his great work for us. Uh, So goes the tradition. But they were told, do not go out into the streets. Don't go out and share your faith. And so some of these compromising families said, okay, well, we can still train our own kids. We can still teach them the way that we want to. We get free land. We can. How about we'll just be a great influence? We'll just be an influence. Now, obviously, preaching the gospel goes hand in hand. If you are not a good influence, if you are not a good example, your word will fall on deaf ears anyway. But if you refuse to speak the truth, you are compromising extraordinarily. And so these people apparently, as tradition tells us, history tells us, they compromised on that and they began this idea. They taught their children, just don't share your faith. Don't share your faith. To the point now today, a lot of Mennonites feel like it's against the Bible. It's against the Bible to share their faith. When the very first command Jesus gives to his disciples before the last command he gives before to his disciples before he leaves the earth is go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Oh, no, 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 you don't preach. Just keep quiet. Just be a good influence. So you can see there's traditions that are being followed, but are they the traditions that should be followed? Now, if we go back to that same verse that we started on, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, we didn't finish that verse. Hold fast, stand fast, hold the traditions which you have been taught, comma, whether by word or our epistle. Those are the parts that the Mennonite faith often forgets to point out. Keep the traditions that Paul gave to the church. 
Keep the traditions that are written in the Bible. Don't, don't stray from what Paul, the apostle, Peter, James, and John wrote to the early churches. Walk according to the truth that has been revealed in the Bible. These are our traditions that we ought to keep. In the next chapter, uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, Paul says this, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Not which you received of your parents, not the traditions that you got from your church, but what you got from the Bible, from the Apostle Paul's writings, from the epistles and the way that we have taught the tradition that you received of us. And then he gives some explanation as to what kind of tradition he's referring to. But you can see throughout this book in First or Second Thessalonians, there's a lot of commands given to go out and do some extraordinary things. Um, even, even if you just look right there at that first passage I quoted, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, keep the traditions as you have received them. He says, um, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So Paul, who just said keep the traditions, is now saying you should have absolute comfort and hope in what Christ has done. How many Mennonites do you know have absolute confidence in what Christ has done? Another German saying, they would say, oh, we, can't blows hoopen. we can only hope that we have salvation. We cannot be assured. Here he says, I want you to have a consolation, meaning a comfort in, in, in good hope through grace. Recognize that when God is gracious to you, you should have comfort in the fact that he saved you by his work. And this is completely contrary to Mennonite tradition. In the Mennonite tradition, you cannot know that you're saved. Here he's saying we should have great consolation in hope, in the grace of God. And that's not found, that's not found in the Mennonite tradition. So which tradition should we follow here then? Another passage where Jesus actually addresses this. He says this in Mark chapter 7. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and other many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. So Mennonites, on one hand, are trying to keep their own traditions, but while they're doing that, they're rejecting the commandment of God. Don't preach the gospel. Just keep it to yourself. Don't push it on anybody. Don't ever evangelize. Jesus said to go and preach the gospel to all the world. Jesus said that the only way you can get someone saved is by sharing the truth. with. How can they hear except there be a preacher? How can they preach except we send them? And, and blessed are those that have their feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Clearly, we ought to be preaching. So which tradition should we be following here? It's not the Mennonite tradition in that regard. However, I've seen a lot of errors on the opposite side, and I've been guilty of some of the same. So in my early excitement, to realize, when I realized that a lot of what I had been taught was merely tradition and not biblical standards, I tossed off certain things that I thought were unimportant. Uh, we could find all kinds of examples. Simple dress, modesty. Uh, I'm not saying that you have to dress like a Mennonite by no means. But the principle that they established 200, 300, 400 years ago of being clothed, being cautious, being courteous or, um, you know, women not going out into the workforce, women not uh, having careers and jobs. We, a lot of Mennonites got saved and then they said, oh, the Mennonite traditions was all a bunch of useless stuff and they toss all that out. Then you go back and you read the scriptures and you read it carefully and you realize, oh, the Mennonites may not have known why they believe these things, but it's in the Bible. So many of the traditions we received were because of the Bible influencing our forefathers, our great grandparents and great grandparents and so on and so forth. Or sometimes it wasn't even necessarily scripture, but it was sound wisdom. Uh, for instance, when I first got saved, I realized that there are Christians from all different races, ethnicities, creeds, and doctrines. There's Christians all over this world. So I thought, why did we always hold to Mennonites marrying Mennonites? Why? What's the big idea? What's wrong with my daughter's Mary? English boys or, uh, you know, uh, Chinese boys, as long as they're good Christians. 
there's nothing biblically wrong with that because we are every tribe, nation, kindred, tongue, are Christians. We're all one in Jesus. However, as I've gotten older and a little bit wiser, I've come to realize there's actually a lot of value in that. Marriage is very, very hard. Relationships are very, very hard. And no matter how closely connected you are, you're still going to rub each other the wrong way. So if you now take two people from two totally different cultures and try to bring them together, it works. It can work. But it can lead to a lot of difficulty and and trouble. Now, I don't think we need to establish a tradition saying you have to marry within your ethnicity or your background or your culture. By no means. Many people have made it work, and I think it can work gloriously, especially if you both believe the gospel. However, I start to realize, hey, there's some value in some of these traditions. But we should stand on them first and foremost because the Bible says so. Secondly, because there's good, solid, biblical, or Uh, principles and reasons as to why we hold to these traditions. Not just, well, Zohavadat Amma Yehot. You know, we always had it this way, we're going to keep it that way. Uh, Got to believe it be what do you learn at us. You know, just stay with what you've learned. Those, that's not a good reason. The good reason should be because the Word of God says so, because the epistles of Paul say so. Now, we should ultimately be about doing good works, and we should be, as Christians, be about sharing the good news of the Lord Jesus. Because you might dress this way, you might look that way, you might go to church here, you might go to church there, you might keep certain days holy, you might not, you might eat certain foods, you you might not, you might wear certain clothes, you might not wear certain clothes, you might go to this place or not go to this place, but none of those things will help anybody if you're trying to get them out of sin. None of those things will help anybody if you're trying to save their soul. What is it that we can teach them that can save people's souls? We have the power of of life in our lips. What is it? It is this. The, The gospel is this. Jesus Christ became a man. God took upon himself the form of a servant. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He took upon himself our sin. He was bruised for our iniquity. He was chastised for our peace. And by by him being whipped and tortured and beaten and bruised, we were healed. We were let go. We were forgiven. We are now made righteous. We are made holy in God's sight because of what Jesus has done. And now if you get focused on clothes or routines or tradition or principles, whatever it might be, and you focus on this, focus on this, focus on this, you might create some religious hypocrites, but you won't create passionate Jesus-following, born-again saints. But if you can convince people that Jesus Christ gave himself for them, not only did he die for them, but that he rose again and he's seated in the heavenly places and he's coming back to receive us to himself. And our life is now so intertwined with his that our life is hid with Christ in God. Then you can create or you can help God in the work of recreating people, borning them again getting them to understand who God is on the deepest possible level, that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now keep this tradition. This is a tradition you ought to keep. Go preach the gospel. Share the good news with your family, your friends, your co-workers. This is things that we ought to still focus on, pay attention. And not to dismiss good, valuable family traditions that you might have or good cultural traditions that you might have, but don't hang your hat on them. There's only one hope that we have, and it's not in following tradition. It's in the man, Christ Jesus. We have one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. God became a man, and he now stands in between. God the Father could not identify with man. Man could not identify with God the Father. And so God became flesh so that he could dwell with us and identify with us and feel with us. And then he lived like we ought to have lived. He ascended up to heaven after his death, burial, and resurrection. And now he can join us together. We have a mediator between God and men. This is what we should cling to. This is what our hope is. It is not in tradition, it is not in religion, it is not in culture, it is not in do's and don'ts, it is in the man, Christ Jesus.